Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, scientists, researchers, guests, and friends. My name is David Moore. I'm the interim director of the library uh, in Lewis Simon Library here at UA Huntsville. And uh, welcome you here this afternoon to this uh, event. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and to mark this occasion of the 100th anniversary of the birthday of Dr. Warren Rambon. And also to recognize his visionary influence on UA Huntsville. Uh, we mark this occasion today with a panel discussion with three distinguished guests followed by an unveiling of the new Von Braun marker here in the library. And finally we'll adjourn to the library art gallery up the ramp here for a uh, mu musical performance with uh, Von Braun's original compositions. And there will also be pictures and photographs on the wall and displays and actual uh, artifacts that we have from archives here in the library of the, of the uh, Space Age that you can see. Um, and also, afterwards, there will be videos of Von Braun playing in this room as well. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some distinguished guests that we have in our audience. Mrs. Jackie Dannenberg, are you here? Can you stand, please? This is the spouse of Dr. Kim Also, Kim and Karen Tail, are you here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Karen's uh, great uncle was. Uh, uh, a scientist on the Pen and Monday project. And Conrad's first boss. And Conrad's first boss. Thank you. <laughs> and Mr. Victor Grimes. Are you here, sir? There we go. Mr. Grimes. <laughs> Mr. Grimes, now 91 years old. He was a uh, graphic artist with the Marshall Space Flight Center back in the 60s, and he worked with Von Braun on creating uh, graphic designs mm -hmm. of the projects that they were working on to communicate that to the public. So, yeah. All right. Well, now to our panel discussion. Uh, we have three panelists with us today, and the first one I'd like to introduce to you is Dr. Chuck Lundquist. Uh, he is a longtime Huntsville space scientist who worked at the U.S. Army with Von Braun, and during the mid-50s, uh, Lundquist acted as the chief of the physics and astrophysics branch of the research project office here at Marshall, and he participated in the planning, uh, launch, and analysis of Explorer 1 and early, other early U.S. satellites. Uh, Lundquist eventually went on to serve as the Assistant Director for Science at the Astrophysical Observatory at the uh, Smithsonian Institution for 11 years before coming back to Huntsville uh, to work again at Marshall, uh, this time becoming involved in the Skylab and the shuttle program. In 1981, Lundquist joined UA Huntsville, and during the 80s and 90s, he served in such roles as visiting professor of physics, uh, Associate VP for Research and the Director of the Consortium for Materials Space uh, uh, Development in Space. Uh, most recently, Lundquist continues his efforts at UA Huntsville by serving as Director of the Inter Interactive Projects Office at Research Institute, and he also has a second office here in the library and has been a great asset and advocate for the library here. Please <laughs> join me in welcoming Dr. Chuck Lundquist. I hope you can all hear and see me if we sit down. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. In 1950, when the Army selected Huntsville as the site for its permanent rocket and missile development program, uh, the main factor in that choice was the availability of a lot of land, as many of you know. The culture of Huntsville at that time, the commercial and academic environment, largely centered on agriculture, not physical science and engineering. Uh, the Army programs that came here were supported, as you know, by a small core of German rocket scientists and augmented by uniformed and civilian Army personnel moved to Huntsville from Fort Bliss, Texas. 
To accomplish the Army objectives, a pressing need was to recruit a much larger staff of engineers, scientists, and managers. But it was difficult to get such people in those days to move to Huntsville. As described by Dr. Von Braun in his own words, uh, he was, of course, the leader of the civilian part of the Army. We have a quote from him. The top people in the government, this is a quote straight out of one of his talks, the top people in government industry today like to improve themselves. They like flourishing research institutions. They thrive on them. If they have a bachelor's degree, they want a master's. If they have a master's, they want a PhD. And if they have a PhD, they want to teach and do research. So our young engineers with bachelor's degrees are not satisfied. If they could get advanced degrees and remain near an academic environment, they would stay with us. Lacking such opportunities, they want to move to California and Massachusetts. So that's the nature of the problem that existed in Huntsville for Von Braun and his team in the early 50s. Well, the nearest Alabama institution that was authorized to and staffed to give graduate level instruction and to grant advanced degrees in physical science and engineering was the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Thus, it was necessary for the Army management to urge the university officials in Tuscaloosa to set up some kind of a graduate program in, in Huntsville. Uh, actually, to be more frank about it, uh, Von Braun and the generals took uh, President Rose by the scruff of the neck and, and gave him a proposition he couldn't refuse. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but meanwhile, the Huntsville community leaders had independently recognized that they had a requirement for technical and undergraduate instruction here in Huntsville. So in response to these requirements and, and in response to being uh, grabbed by the generals and, and von Braun, in the early 1950s, a fledgling extension of the University of Alabama began offering undergraduate and graduate courses in, in Huntsville. By 1957, the graduate program in Huntsville had grown to a good size, and it was motivated the Army to charter a thing called the Army Joint Graduate Study Steering Committee to coordinate between the Army interests and the uh, university. Uh, at that time, Von Braun and the generals had to pass on some of this work to some, some of the staff people. They, there was just a lot of stuff going on. So the, the Graduate Study Steering Committee was jointly chartered by Major General Medeiros, commanding of the Army Missile Agency, and Major General Toftoy, commanding Redstone Arsenal. I don't expect you to read all that, but their <laughs> signatures are up there in the, in the right-hand corner, just to prove that, in fact, they were the ones that did the charter. The Graduate Study Steering Committee became the Army's tool to work with the university to enhance the graduate program, available to employees of the Army and to the contractors of the Army. Over subsequent years, as the U.S. government's level of rocketry activity in Huntsville grow, grew, so did the graduate program. On July 1st, 1960, the Marshall Space Flight Center was established with Dr. Von Braun as its director. Uh, and in August and the, the next month, the Graduate Study Steering Committee had to be rechartered as a joint Marshall and MICOM committee by Dr. Von Braun and Major General Sch Schomburg, <laughs> then commander of the Army Ordnance uh, Missile Command. And again, I don't expect you to read everything, but you, you see the signatures of Von Braun and Schomburg there. Well, eventually the Graduate Study Steering Committee uh, initiated negotiations with the university that led to the establishment in 1960 of a University of Alabama Research Institute in Huntsville, and initially with, with just minimal funding. 
And on May 25, 1961, as I'm sure all of you know, the Huntsville rocketry activity got a new impetus when President John F. Kennedy committed the U.S. to send men to the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. Given the need to staff up for the lunar program and support the new research institute, Dr. Von Braun then addressed a joint session of the Alabama legislature on June 20th, 1961. And you will all be able to get a, a copy of that complete uh, presentation by Von Braun uh, when you uh, visit the, uh, the pictures out, out in front. So I won't read any quotations from it since you'll be able to, to read them all. Uh, he re-argued in this the obligation of Alabama to support a vital academic program in Huntsville and endorsed a $3 million funding request for the Research Institute. The legislature passed a bond issue, and that was then voted on by the citizens of Alabama, and a $3 million bond issue was issued for the Research Institute. Two excerpts from the January 1962 meeting of the Graduate Study Steering Committee illustrate a typical interactions between the committee and the University of Alabama activities in, in Huntsville. Uh, item number one there shows you the composition at this time of the committee. Uh, it changed from year to year, so that's just one sample of the kind of people that are on the committee. And item two gives a report of the course and student statistics for the winter 1961 academic quarter. And how many people had applied for degrees and how many courses were being offered and so forth under this program. Recognizing that the Research Institute had been established and that a bond issue for a building to house the Institute had been approved and that Dr. Rudolph Herman has been engaged as its director. Item 4 of the minutes documents that the subcommittee of the uh, Graduate Study Steering Committee, who had been empowered to promote the Research Institute, they'd done their job and the Research Institute was now on its, on its way and doing well. Uh, incidentally, Item 5 documents that another subcommittee to study appropriate federal library facilities in Huntsville had completed its work. And of course, library facilities was another problem that had to be treated somehow or other to have a viable graduate program in Huntsville. You have to have a research library if you're going to uh, have such a program. And uh, setting up the Redstone Scientific Information Center was one solution. Uh, you'll hear about the solutions at the UAH uh, in the later speakers. Well, 1969 was a historic year for Huntsville and for the, uh, the nation. The academic activity in Huntsville had grown to the extent that an autonomous university campus in Huntsville was created as part of a three-campus system, the University of Alabama system. This was a much-wanted goal in Huntsville. Huntsville had wanted to have a, a full-blown university for science and technology and engineering, and, and now, in 1969, they got that as one campus of the three-campus system. But also in uh, 1969, the Saturn V rocket developed here, successfully launched men to the moon, followed by their safe return to Earth, so that President Kennedy's commitment had been satisfied. Both of these events, the establishment of a full university in Huntsville and the landing on the moon, owe a great deal to Dr. Von Braun. Uh, shortly thereafter, in 1970, Dr. Von Braun transferred to Hunt, from Huntsville to Washington, and the university was on its own and has been growing and prospering ever since. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lundquist. Our second uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Fred Ordway. 
Dr. Ordway is also a longtime Huntsville space, space scientist, and he worked at Fort Von Braun's rocket team at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and later at the Marshall Space Flight Center. <clears throat> this was the team that launched the first American satellite, Explorer 1, in January of 58, and the same team uh, put the nation's first man in space aboard a Redstone Mercury rocket in May of 61 <laughs> and sent Apollo astronauts to the moon on the Saturn V later. During the mid-60s, Ordway served as technical advisor for Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke on the film 2001, A Space Odyssey. He is the former director and member of the Board of Governors of the National Space Society and member of the Space Advisory Council on the U.S. and Space at Rocket Center. For many years, he was professor at the U.A. Hospital School of Graduate Studies. Ordway was also an early employee of the Research Institute here in Huntsville. <coughs> He was the lead person involved in getting the Willie Lay science fiction collection for the library. And he also worked with Mr. Dave Christensen on the uh, Saturn V collection as well. Ordway is the author of over 200 articles, an author or co-author of several dozen books, among them Warner von Braun, Crusader for Space, and The Rocket's Red Glare in 1976. He has served as the editor of both the Journal of Astronautics and also the 12 volume Advances in Space Science and Technology. But please join me in welcoming Dr. Fred Wolfway. Thank you very much. I want to tell you that I'm a Yankee, uh, brought up in New York and in the state of Maine. When I came here, Huntsville was known as the Watercrest Capital USA. <laughs> I always remember that. What I want to talk about today is the connection that led to the Willie Lay uh, Library here. It's a major, major collection uh, of books and, and other uh, elements. Willie Lay was a, uh, a space cadet, you could say, back in early Germany. He joined the uh, uh, organization called the Voraussevater uh, Society for, for Space Travel in Germany back in the 20s and became the vice president of that society in 1927, which had grown to 500 members. The, the interest in, in Germany was incredible. We in the United States formed our first interplan American Interplanetary Society in 1930. And and he became vice president. And one of the young members of that society was Werner von Braun back in the 1920s. So I've made the first connection to bringing this library uh, here. He was an amateur rocket experimenter, but he was also a writer. He loved interviews with the German press, and he wrote articles, and he also in, uh, entered into co uh, communication with similar colleagues in other countries, United States and uh, Russia and uh, uh, Great Britain with, with, and, and France were the major ones. In 1935, he, uh, the, the deteriorating situation in Germany uh, after Hitler's inauguration in 1934 let him to immigrate. He had a distant, very distant uh, Jewish uh, uh, great-grandmother which would put him on the list of suspects. And he, he left. He went to Britain first to talk to colleagues there with the British Interplanetary Society and later settled in New York. His 1943 book on rockets, after he got here, he wrote a great deal in our country, uh, was, uh, became a, a very, very well known. It, it grew, uh, to rockets and space travel and, and, and later to rockets, uh, uh, and, uh, in 1947 and rockets, missiles and space travel, uh, four years later. Now, I'm a guy who has been interested in rockets almost till I was a teenager. I joined the American Rocket Society in 1941 when I was 13, and I wore today, or it sits over here, my 70-year pin. I thought I'd be appropriate. Last year, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronauts gave me my 70-year pin as a member of the, that was a successor organization. And in that context, I met Willie Lay in New York. I'm a New Yorker. I was going to school in New York, and I mingled with the, all the early American rocketeers, uh, John Chester and Lovell Lawrence and Jimmy Wilde and, uh, and uh, uh, Franklin Pierce, amongst others that later formed a company which I worked for. So we uh, worked very, very closely uh, with Bully Lay from way back. Now, when did I meet Werner von Braun? It was on the 13th of October, 1952, at the uh, American Museum of Natural Histories, uh, Hayden Planetarium, Second Symposium on Spaceflight. 
They'd given uh, two, one before, one uh, uh, in 1954 later. And that, at, at that uh, space flight symposium, which was, the symposium was chaired by none other than Willie Lay, one of the speakers was Verna von Braun, and the other, another speaker was uh, Dr. Fred Whipple, who had been my astronomy guy at, at Harvard. So I, I, I met Willie through uh, Fred Whipple and through uh, 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 Willie Lay, I met Verna von Braun on the 13th of October, uh, 1952, at the Space Flight Symposium at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. And uh, at that time, I was first employed by Reaction Motors Incorporated, which had been founded by the original members of the American Interplanetary Society, which became the American Rock Society, which I mentioned their names a few minutes ago. And then I later became, uh, I was given a promotion and worked for the Guided Missile Division of Republic Aviation uh, in Hicksville, Long Island. So I was in just western New York and eastern New York uh, during this period, and I became very active in the American Astronautical Society and the American Rocket Society. And Vernon von Brown, in those days, that's where he appeared to give major presentations. They were both headquartered in New York. They're now headquartered in Washington. So I got to know Verna von Braun in that connection. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, be became, I can think, friends in, in a way. I mean, he was a much bigger man than I was, lonely sort of low, low cal caliber engineer. But we, we worked well together in, in that context. And one day, Verna von Braun said he was going out to Long Island, where I lived. And he said, where should he stay? And I blurted out, well, you can stay with us. We had a pretty good-sized house. So I had Verna von Braun as a, a, in my home in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in New York. And my company had been active in the rocketry business. It fired its rockets from the Naval Air Rocket Test Station in Picatinny Arsenal in northern New Jersey. And uh, so we, 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 we were, you know, intellectually compatible. Well, let's, let's go forward. So I now know, I uh, knew Verna von Braun since I was very, uh, I mean, uh, Willie Lay since I was very young. And we both lived on Long Island when I worked for Republic uh, on Long Island. And his wife, Alder, and my wife, Marua, became good friends. And we socialized a great deal. So we were very, very close friends. And uh, after Willie Lay died suddenly, a heart attack in 1969, just weeks before the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. What an ironic time to die. The guy that fits since the 1920s had been dreaming of space travel. And I'm going to show my first image. No, that's our second image. <laughs> this is my first image. And I want to show you one of Willie Lay's books. He edited this book back in Germany, a part of his library. I want to start getting into his library situation, the possibilities of space travel. And many of the top Germans, uh, Guido von uh, Pierke, uh, Willie Lay, Hermann Obert, and many other Germans wrote articles in this very, very important book, which is here in the collection. Willie Lay's wife, upon the death of, of Willie, contacted me and said that she had been approached by many book dealers, knowing of his collection, which was not only in the field of rocketry and space travel, but in the field of paleontology. He had a, and he had a marvelous library, a lot of rare books, and they were, they were asking about, uh, if, would she sell the books three, eight, and nine on his listing or whatever. I mean, and I, uh, uh, Olga, I said, Olga, I don't recommend that you do this. I think you should keep that collection solid. So I call Verna von Braun, whom I knew uh, uh, quite well by then, and I said, Olga Lay has contacted me and wants to sell Willie's collection. What can we do? And he said immediately, let's bring it to Huntsville, Alabama. So there we go. Fred Ordway contacting Verna von Braun, an old friend of Willie Lay. The library's in New York, which I'm a New Yorker. Bring it to Huntsville, Alabama. 
So what we did was to get letters of, 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 of for, uh, for Olga Lay, because she had some financial problems. Willie Lay had not left his finances in very good shape. And one of our best friends was Fred Durant and myself. We helped her out financially, just to, to, to tied her over during this very, very difficult time between the death of her husband and uh, 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 the, the, the present situation. And so we sent letters. I, I made a list of the letters I had from Vernon Ever, uh, Brown, Eberhard Reese, Ernst Stuhlinger, Rudolf Herman from our institution, John F. Porter from our institution, Mitchell Sharp. And uh, we got these strong letters of, of approval, and she agreed to sell. And then we were also boosted by Dr. Frank, uh, Frank Rose uh, in Tuscaloosa, the chancellor at the time. But the university couldn't react that quickly and p produce the money that she needed. So I agreed to buy the collection, and the university agreed to repay me uh, uh, in increments. So I wrote my first check on the 5th of May, 1970, to buy the collection, and we were on the road. The next day, on the 6th of May, I spent 10 hours with Olga at the, her home in Jackson Heights, uh, uh, New York, which is on Long Island, and getting to know the contractors. They were, they were, she had um, um, uh, uh, Mayflower and, uh, and Allied contractors, and how they planned to prepare to organize this collection and, and to get it ready for um, shipping. On the 7th of May, I found myself oversizing them as they loaded 175 cartons of Willie Lay's books onto their trucks. Wow, I said to myself, this comes from my diaries, I keep daily diaries, we made it, only a thousand miles to go, which thousand miles was New York to Huntsville, Alabama. The Willie Lay collection arrived here safely on the 18th of May, 1970, and on the 19th I helped librarian John Perot, who was your precursor and his team to sort things out in a very, very preliminary way. So now we're here in, in, in Huntsville. Let's see, I have a few notes here if I recollect everything. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the collection was now close to Verna Von Brown, who had been a col uh, collaborator of Willie Lay since early rocket experimental years in the 1920s back in Germany. The library is here. It's an incredible library. Believe me, I know it very, very well. I lived it. We, we, my, my wife and I would spend many, many days having dinner with the, with the Lays in New York. They had books even in the, in the bathroom. It was so extensive. <laughs> Beginning in March and April 1971, uh, uh, the Willie Lay collection was more, uh, occupied more and more of my time. We were getting ready for the Spring Press program to launch the Willie Lay Memorial Collection at the M. Lewis Summon Library uh, here in Huntsville. On the 15th of April, uh, historians began to arrive. I've made arrangements with a lot of historians to come down here. Uh, Derek de la Sola Price from Yale, Melvin Cranberg, Cranberg from uh, Carnegie, uh, uh, Mellon and others. And that evening, Verna Von Braun and Maria Von Braun gave a reception at their home, welcoming these people from out of town. Governor Wallace, by the way, was amongst the uh, uh, invitees. On the 16th of April, 1971, UAH President Ben Brave, who became a very good friend of mine, we were great tennis buddies at the, uh, uh, at the club here in Huntsville, Von Braun and Art Rudolph gave opening addresses. Let me show that picture next, which is my, yep, yeah, this one here. Well, this is uh, Dave and I uh, working on the collection, and there's Vernon Von Brown, and Jean Perrault, who was the library at the time, Olga Lay, and then uh, Benjamin Graves, who was the president of UAH at the inaugural ceremonies. Uh, that's Fred Ody on the left, Olga Lay, uh, Vernon Von Brown, and in the rear uh, happened to be a man named Herman Nordung, uh, who was a, 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 a spaceflight pro, uh, a pro, pioneer going back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who had written a book on space stations, the first book on space stations. This is really a parenthesis of my lecture or talk tonight. Uh, uh, he was a Slovenian, actually, but he wrote in German since he was uh, with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He wrote in German a very, very basic book on space stations. Uh, the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama system uh, back here, Dave Christensen on the left. God, 
look at your hair. I know. <laughs> Art Rudolph, uh, Vernon Von Brown, and all the lay were listening while Ver, uh, by, uh, Benjamin Grave gave the first of, of several uh, talks. And Dave, uh, later in the day, uh, gave a, a talk on the organization of the collection and what the collection was, was all about. Uh, and let's go to the next one here. Now, I followed on with all of this with a, with a uh, chairing a symposium on uh, uh, space flight in the 1970s uh, with uh, Dr. De uh, Sola Price, Kranzberg, Roger, uh, Bill Stein, and, uh, and John Bell, historians, uh, giving comments on the value and the importance of the collection. We had a postma postmaster blunt luncheon afterward, and that evening at my home we gave a, a reception for about 50 people sort of celebrating the day, and then a small group of us ended up at the Elegant uh, Restaurant. Anyway, that's the story of how we connected Bernard Von Brown, Willie Lay, and myself in various contexts over the years. Yeah, this is the one you wanted, I think. Yeah, this is our final picture. I'm on the left, all the way to the right. That was uh, Herman Nordung, not in the picture. It's just one of uh, Willie Lay's uh, collection. Uh, he's happened to be there, and Vernon von Brown on the right. <laughs> that Willie, uh, that uh, uh, Herman Nordung was the guy that really laid out the whole logic of, uh, of, a, of a space station concept and what it would do for the advance of the space travel. And I think that brings us all together. Thank you very much for your attention. And on behalf of the library, I thank you, Dr. Wayne, for securing the Willie Lake collection for the library. Uh, our final, our final uh, panelist is Mr. Dave Christensen. And uh, as by way of introduction, Mr. Christensen began his career in rocketry in 1953 in Fort Bliss, Texas, and also at the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico. He joined the Von Braun rocket team as the uh, Army Ballistic Missile Agency in February 1956, uh, working on liquid rocket propulsion systems for the Redstone, Jupiter, and Saturn rockets. Christensen started his own consulting firm in June 1960 to provide representation for aerospace firms. In 1967, he joined the University of Alabama in Huntsville as a senior research associate and initiated the Saturn History Program, which involved uh, extensive documentation, research, and interviews, and eventually led to the NASA of books, Stages to Saturn. While at UA Huntsville, Mr. Christensen was director of alternate energy research and led many research studies investigating the use of solar energy for Earth-based and space-based power systems. In 1974, he led a research effort under NASA contract to investigate the use of the planned space shuttle for educational purposes. He also performed extensive interviews for the book The Rocket Team, which is the definitive story of Von Braun's early team of scientists. Beginning in 1980, Mr. Christensen worked uh, for several major aerospace firms, including United Technologies, Wiley Laboratories, and Lockheed Martin, on a variety of space programs. He ended his career as senior staff engineer and manager of business development for Lockheed Martin Astronautics, uh, worked there from 96 to 04. Since his retirement, Christensen has supported the UH Space Program Archives development and oral history projects. As a consultant, he has performed peer reviews of internal uh, space exploration proposals for NASA headquarters. He is currently supporting NASA in the development of knowledge-based information systems and has also been a big advocate of the library as well. Please welcome me and Dave Christensen. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here at the university. I, I never went anywhere. I still have an office over at the Culture Research Center, so I hang around. And I'm in the archives a lot. I just placed 60 boxes of research. research material down there, and I've got about 100 to go. So if anybody wants to volunteer to go through materials and organize it, <laughs> but it's being used. Uh, some of the students are using those materials. Just the other day, there was a student that was using it for his... Uh, Research. His PhD. That's good. That's good. Anyway, uh, it's good to be with old friends, Fred and Chuck. We go way back. We've worked on many projects together, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, I want to talk mostly about Dr. Von Brown as an educator, and he, his knowledge, his charisma, and the lectures he gave, and the public awareness that he presented for space was all part of his educational effort. And it was public education as well as educating the engineers that worked for him. So he was uh, 
an excellent educator, as was Dr. Stuhlinger, who came from a long line of educators. So that's in the genes of the Germans, I think. And uh, if you remember Collier's magazine, which inspired a lot of us back in the early 50s to become interested in space travel, well, we decided to put a magazine out in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, before Sputnik, called Space Journal. And I'll just pass this around since I don't have a slide. I, I'm old school. I'm flip charts, so <laughs> and slide roofs. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what you see there is the team, and you see Dr. Uh, Von Brown. You see uh, it'll pass around. You see Dr. Oberth, who was his mentor, and Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger. And they uh, participated in these magazines. In fact, we published uh, seven of those before Marshall came to Huntsville. This was all with the Army. And I'll just read a couple of the titles. And Fred and Chuck worked on these too, so I'll mention that. The first edition was dedicated to Dr. Oberth, and that's what you see here, even before Sputnik went up. The second edition uh, included an article about Robert Goddard and Explorer One, which Chuck Lundquist participated in. The third edition uh, included an article by Werner von Braun called The Acid Test. So he was always challenging this country, particularly what the Russians were doing. So this is what that article was about. And the next volume got even more specific. It, was, it had the Russian challenge and a village on the moon. So he was working, beating the Russians, and what can we do, including putting a village on the moon. <clears throat> and then the next one was quite unique. It had a front and back cover that we actually sold separate. And let me mention, this was all voluntary. We didn't get a penny for this. In fact, I was the money man, like Fred. I was the advertising manager. <laughs> so we had Chrysler automobiles and all kind of stuff in these magazines. So I had to go out and get the money. Uh, but we made some money off of the sales. We did sell it on the newsstands and sold uh, subscriptions. And that money went to build the observatory up on the mountain because Dr. Von Braun always said, we want to see where we're going. And that's why Stuhlinger and the Germans all helped build the domes. So a lot of nighttime work. And uh, we were very busy on the Redstones and Jupiters in 58, 59. We were starting to build up to catch up with the Russians with the Saturn I. And that was quite a, a feat because we took Jupiters and Saturns and improved the Jupiter engine and made a cluster that had one and a half million pounds of thrust very quickly, as opposed to the Russians who had one million, which they're still flying today and putting our astronauts up. They kept the basic rocket that put Sputnik up and put the first uh, Russian astronaut up and still fly today and make money off of it. We threw all the Saturns away, Saturn 1, Saturn 5, Saturn 1B, all that's gone. And now the shuttle's gone, so we didn't learn our lesson. Seven years without a way to get to space, and now we're right back in the same boat. <clears throat> and the cover of the next edition was done by an artist, Harry Longy, who worked with Fred on the movie 2001. He liked England so well, he stayed over he there. Stayed there. <laughs> but it was a beautiful cover. It looked like... Uh, Jurassic Park with a spaceship sitting down on a planet full of dinosaurs. And the next one uh, showed an interstellar spaceship and a technical discussion of how to build one. And there's another old German named George von Tiesenhausen who just wrote a novel on that very subject and asked me to review it. And I did. And it was a good uh, look. I told him to make a movie out of it. And now he's getting the Space and Rocket Center to print it. It needs some editing, but you'll see a a new interstellar spacecraft uh, trip by uh, George von Tiesenhaus. And the final edition uh, showed an iron-powered space vehicles uh, to go to Mars. That's, that was Ernst Stuhlinger's dream. And we talked about that at the Stuhlinger Symposium here a couple of years ago. And in 61, uh, I worked with an artist named Tom Spencer, and you'll remember him. And I'll pass this around. This was the plan to go to Mars circa 1961. And these were large panels that could be set up. And when Shepard went up on the redstone, we put these on the square. So if you see pictures of the square, you'll see these panels seven feet tall. I don't know what happened to them. But if you look at the sequence here, this is where we were, and this is where we wanted to go. 
That was Stuhlinger and Von Brown's dream. And we'll talk about that some more. I'll pass that around. You can look at it. So I get those back. Okay, let's go ahead then. That's the Space Journal. In any way, uh, it was successful for what the purpose was, and it's a shame that it didn't continue to be produced. <clears throat> and then also, I, I'll mention Von Braun Hall is the old research institute, so the money that went to build that building uh, is still there, still the research center. And a few years ago, I was asked to do a display, uh, and people like Chuck helped me and others, and Stu Langer. And if you haven't seen it, it shows the first 14 years from 1950 to 1974 that Von, Von Brown team was in Huntsville and what they were working on. Has anyone seen it or not seen it? Is, are you familiar with it? It's, it's inside of the Research Institute building. It's called Von Brown Hall. And it's free if you want to go a self-walking tour. It's very interesting. And also, uh, that same building recently celebrated 50 years of research. So it's been 50 years since the Institute was founded. And Chuck uh, played a key role in putting that display together. So if you go to the back of the building, you can go year by year, 50 years. It's not real big, but you can see what kind of research has been going on. So that's the product of what Dr. Von Brown did. That's the point. 50 years of research. I don't know how many million dollars that would be accumulative. Who knows? Billion, probably. Yeah. Right. So it's a good payoff. Education is a good payoff. Uh, I passed out a chart of the uh, time frame of Dr. Von Brown during his lifetime. Did everyone get one of those? There's some more on the back table if you didn't get one. As you go out, there's one. And, and also, I left another uh, uh, handout on the archives located in the Huntsville area. So if you didn't get those two, they're on the back table. I think we made enough. Uh, Fred mentioned Stages to Saturn by Roger Bilstein. Uh, that was quite a project. I went all over the country gathering documents because after the Apollo moon landing, uh, we lost interest. And we were shutting down programs, and so the engineering phase was essentially over. We were down to just operations. We, we built a whole fleet of Saturns. We didn't fly all of them. We built a, a Skylab space station, put it up with one launch. It took 40 shuttle launches to put one up, one, one Saturn V launch. And the second one was built as a backup and never flown, and it's sitting in the Smithsonian. So that is flight hardware. <clears throat> paid for, mm -hmm. and we had Saturn rockets paid for, mm -hmm. and so we've been very short-sighted in our space exploration plans. And a lot of that's politics, as you well know, and money. So the technical part is not the problem, it's the politics and the uh, money f the budgeting problems. Okay, Fred mentioned the Whitty Lake collection. That was quite a, a good project. <clears throat> I'm glad we did that, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I, then I started up a, a research center in May of 71, and at that time there was a lot of interest in the environmental programs. So I call it the Center for Environmental Studies, and I needed some seed money just to put the presentation together. So I went down to the city council and told them what I planned to do, and they gave me $5,000. <clears> you, you wouldn't believe what that $5,000 accumulated over the next uh, nine or ten years in solar energy, wind energy, uh, buildings all over the country. NASA got involved, DOE, UAH, IBM. This became a major, major program. And then we changed the name to Center for en uh, Environmental and Energy Studies. And then uh, also later, the Propulsion Research Center uh, used that building, which became the Johnson Research Center. So it had several names. And still around, there's still a Johnson Research Center. But if you look at the uh, output of the work of that center, that's the results of research. And the results of somebody like Von Brown realizing that research pays back many, many times. <clears throat> and then I worked on a project called Ed Plus, Educational uh, Planning and Uses of the Space Shuttle. But we had some educational programs on Skylab and Apollo, and we were asked here at UAH, to look what could be done from the space shuttle. Well, this was five years before it flew. So we put together a pretty good study. 
and I wanted uh, Dr. Von Brown to comment on it. So on one of his trips down in October 74, he reviewed the study and had some very good advice. And you can get that uh, inter interview, if you want to call it that, online through the archives here. So if anyone's interested in that particular interview. And then uh, Dr. Von Brown was at Fairchild his last four or five years of his life. And he was working on educational and communication satellites. And a little later, we're going to show a part of that, and I'll explain that. But I was with him at his office one day, and he said, uh, you want to go hear a lecture? I said, sure. So we went over to Johns Hopkins Applied Research Lab, and he gave a great lecture on educational and communication satellites because that's what he was working on. And then right at the end, uh, someone asked, uh, what about Mars? Are we ever going to Mars? <clears throat> so he lit up. Remember now, this is uh, 75, just a year and a half before he died, so he was getting a little feeble at that time. But he did light up, and we're going to take a look at it here in just a minute, and see, you'll get to hear Dr. Von Brown's uh, personal response to what about Mars. He just happened to have some stuff with him, so I think he kept it with him. <laughs> but that was certainly a thrill for me to hear him uh, give that story. So Mars was always his subjective. And then finally, the last time that he came to the aid of UAH in Huntsville was for, we were trying to get the National Solar Institute into Huntsville. And I set up a Senate breakfast meeting with Senator Sparkman and Senator Baker, Senator Allen, and Ron Brown, and we even brought in Ed Teller from the h bomb, <laughs> looking for horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, like a recent, another proposal we wrote on optics, it went to Colorado. Mm. They had better sunshine. <laughs> but, but Von Brown made a classic remark. He said, Huntsville gave you the moon, we can give you the sun. So I thought that was classic. And I have that tape and the, all the transcriptions if anybody's interested in that story. So now let's take a few minutes and listen to Dr. Von Brown and see what he has to say about going to Mars from the master himself. Simple earth terminals and quite simple satellites uh, can be useful for voice communication. Oh yes, that, that's no question, Brian. And by the way, this, this was a very useful uh, demonstration rendered by the amateur satellite. When do you see man go into some other body other than the moon? Well, I think uh, the next uh, target for men, other than activities, of course, in low Earth orbit, of which there would be many, will probably be Mars. Uh, we have learned a great deal about the planet Mars during the last two years, particularly through Mariner 9, which mapped the, Mar uh, the planet Mars thoroughly and discovered a few geological phenomena on Mars that nobody had expected. For example, Mars has the highest volcano in the world, in the known in solar system. <laughs> um, that volcano is 16 miles high and has about a total volume, twice uh, as much as the largest volcano on Earth, which is the big island of Hawaii, which when measured from the bottom of the ocean is, I believe, only 11 miles high. So this is twice as big, twice as voluminous. And also there's every indication that it was active in a relatively recent geological period, just judging from the very few meteoric impacts on the crater rim. Now another discovery made by Mariner 9 was a canyon on Mars about, imagine Grand Canyon, stretching all the way from Miami to Seattle, twice as deep and twice as wide. That is a canyon that was detected on Mars. So this too seems to show that Mars is by no means a, ge a geologically uh, dormant or dead planet, but apparently quite active. Now there's of course always a question of lack of water on Mars, there's no doubt about the fact that Mars by and large is pretty arid, but the combination of volcanic heat 
and of, of course also water vapor exuded by volcanic eruptions makes it entirely possible that there are oases on Mars where the environment is quite different from the average. You wouldn't expect by looking at the Sahara Desert that there could be oases with uh, palm trees, for instance. And it is for this reason that uh, um, many people believe that the likelihood of finding uh, even some uh, not very higher forms of life, but at least some higher forms of vegetation on Mars is quite good. Now, I think needless to say, if we do find evidence of life on Mars, the rush will be on again and man probably wants to follow unmanned exploration. The first two Mars soft landers, unmanned, will be launched later this year and are scheduled to soft land on Mars in the summer of 1976, next year. So about a year and a half from now, we will be able to answer the question far more succinctly whether men will probably go to Mars. Uh, let me say this, we made a study in NASA uh, while the Apollo program was still alive on how we would send a man to Mars with modern technology and a scheme emerged that looked something like this. You would build two interplanetary spaceships in a low Earth orbit from parts flown up there with a the shuttle, modularized parts that are stuck together in Earth orbit. You would of course also fuel these two interplanetary spaceships with propellant brought up by the shuttle. These ships would have a nuclear rocket engine. NASA had developed jointly with AEC a nuclear reactor engine that is, is essentially a reactor that operates at 5,000 degrees with a lot of channels leading through the reactor through which you pump liquid hydrogen. The hydrogen is heated up to 5,000 degrees and then simply permitted to expand through a convergent divergent nozzle. The exhaust velocity is about twice as high as that of a combustion hydrogen-oxygen engine such as employed in the upper stages of Saturn V. So it's really a very fuel economic system. And this nuclear rocket engine run in each of these two interplanetary ships would go through several maneuvers. One, drive the ship out of Earth orbit on a trans-Mars trajectory. And there would be a free coasting period, several months, by the way, going to Mars, then the second maneuver would be the capture maneuver of the ship into a circumarchian orbit. And the two ships would remain in that circumarchian orbit, pretty much like we kept the Apollo Command and Service module in orbit around the moon, and made the landing with a separate LEM vehicle. You remember how it was done in Apollo. Now, there would also be a separate Martian version of the LEM, a chemically powered vehicle capable of making a soft landing on Mars and the upper stage flying back to the two ships left circling in Martian orbit for a rendezvous and docking maneuver. And this, circumar this Martian LEM would then be abandoned and the return flight would be conducted with the nuclear-powered ship again, there would be a third power maneuver driving the ships out of the march in orbit, and finally a fourth maneuver capturing them back into the, into the Earth's gravitational field from which the crew would be recovered again with a shuttle. That's essentially the scheme. Now such a program would roughly cost as much as the Apollo program, not more, but also not less. And uh, I think uh, it would probably not involve three people, but uh, a dozen people going to Mars because the, state, uh, the travel time of the entire expedition would be on the order of a year and a half. So you would like to take a cook and a doctor and everything else along. You know, it's a little more like a, an expedition uh, on a sailing ship uh, 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 times of Magellan. <laughs> Well, I tell you, uh, women's lib will see to it that, uh, uh, speaking of women, by the way, I believe that before the end of the century we're going to have a research station on the moon. And there will, of course, of course, also be lady scientists and the first baby will be born on the moon before you know it.
I promised Dr. Von Braun, secretary, to get him in his car at 3.17 and a half, and mm -hmm. since our <laughs> clocks are not synchronized, I think we'd better quit now. Okay. Thank you. One more comment. You, you could see that was ingrained in him to go to Mars. That was his dream. That was his dream. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Herman Norden in his picture. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the companion. That's Warner Von Brown, and that was in the film strips that Fred and I prepared and wrote the scripts, and Dr. Von Brown narrated them. You did two on the Apollo, and I did one on Stations in Space, which that is, and Dividends from Space. So he was doing educational film strips through the Doubleday Multimedia Company, and Fred and I were assisting him. So he was quite an educator. That's my... Thank you. One more time, Dr. Lundquist, Dr. Ordway, Mr. Christensen. Thank you both. Everyone, if you have not uh, done so, there, please pick up your primitive uh, speech of uh, Dr. Von Braun giving uh, to the joint legislature. It's on the table outside. There's also some information on how you can donate financially to the fund to support these efforts, and I ask you to consider doing so. Uh, also, at this time, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Monica Sayer, Mr. Gary Glover, Mr. Andy Hutto, and Mr. Rick Garner on their efforts in putting together, uh, supporting this uh, program here today. Uh, now I'd like to ask all of you to join us as we walk across the way over here and unveil uh, the plaque. Yes, Ms. Ms. Danberg. Do we have a little bit of Q&A? Actually, we sure do, yes. <laughs> Please, I'm sorry. Forgot about that. I've got one. Go ahead. <laughs> Number one, um, not to be embarrassing or anything, but we did miss one person who should have been introduced. Of course. And that would be Heidi Collier. She has taken over Conrad's spot of keeping everybody together. She's in charge of the second generation. And her son, Matt. Um, she is the daughter, Heidi's the daughter of Fritz Weber, one of the Von Brown engineers. I uh, actually just this morning stopped uh, with Karen Teal and her husband, Tim, to see uh, almost 99-year-old Dieter Grau, one of the Von Brown engineers. He was quality assurance, um, and that's always interesting to go visit him. His mind is just as sharp, he's just as alert and everything as Conrad was up to the end. And I like to refer to him as, um, what the guy's name, anyway, he's like the rest of the story guy. What's his name? Paul Harvey? He's the Paul Harvey of the Von Brown team, in my opinion. But anyway, he says that where Von Brown was the dreamer, Eberhard Reese was the realist, the reality check. You hear about Von Brown, you hear about Stuhlinger, you hear about Conrad and all that. You don't hear much about Reese. I would like to hear your ideas on how Reese kept Von Brown on the straight and narrow. Your idea on that. Okay. Well, shall I make some comments? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, I... Uh... I had moved to Washington, Jackie, ju just to, to work to the National uh, Science Foundation, Office of Science and Technology Policy, during the period when we were setting up that original National Space Institute. It was formed in 1974, but the, the official papers were in 1975. And uh, Brown was very, very active in pr promoting uh, the uh, Mars mission. But that was 70. You've got to remember that the the nuclear rocket uh, effort with AEC was canceled in 1972 so that was all dream work he talked a great deal about it but it was uh, it, it, as far as I were concerned it was it, it didn't make any sense because the 1972 came the end of the nuclear rocket program even though it had a great deal of success uh, in, in their test uh, firings uh, out in, in, in Nevada Commenting on Reese, uh, Reese was sort of the, uh, if you take an automobile uh, uh, version, he was the governor on the on the machine that kept everything uh, going smoothly and, and not overreacting. He he was a very, very solid down-to-earth engineer and manager. Absolutely. 
another comment you might make, Dave, when, when Herman Ober came over here for about what a year was it? Years ago. And uh, a little longer than that, actually. whatever it was. And he, he, I remember he mentioned that he was uh, given a desk audit. One time he told me he was with Army gave desk audits in those days. What are you doing? And he said, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that. Yeah, tell the story on Reese and the uh, bomber commander that we took in his office that day. Which one? We we took the the British bomber captain, R, the RAF guy. Oh yeah. And his wife to meet with Dr. Reese in yeah. his office to see what the reaction would be. This is the guy that bombed Pina Mundi. Oh oh, those guys. Yeah. Well, uh, who was it? Well, I I had been active in with the a lot of the. Uh, my father was a a, uh, a flew with the Royal Flying Corps in World War One. And he kept up with the uh, Brits all the time. And we went back in the, in the Second World War about six months before we actually got in the war because of this close connection with the RAF. And they will often talk about those, 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 uh, those uh, bombing days, yeah. And the Brits, believe it or not, the British Interplanetary Society gave Verna von Braun an honorary membership in the British Interplanetary Society within three, maybe four years maximum after World War II. One other quick uh, story. Dr. von Braun's military boss in Germany was Dr. Walter Nornberger. And I was in his home in Buffalo interviewing him, and he pointed out that after the war, he was held in prison in England, mm -hmm. and they were going to hang him. So he had to get out of that mess in a hurry. He found him a good lawyer, and his argument was, you're not hanging the guys that built the tanks or the airplanes or the trucks. Why are you hanging the missile guy? Yeah, yeah. And it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was also a, I think, United Nations uh, agreement that people who worked in the armed forces on armaments during the wars were not guilty of war crimes, mm -hmm. those who worked in the yeah. you know. And that was always an issue, of course, of Werner von Braun. The, the situation was that the missile development uh, was in, in his uh, capacity at Pena Mundi, but the production of the uh, ultimate missile was it was just sent down to a place called Middlework, which was under the capacity of the uh, of the uh, of the SS. I mean, that it, 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 that's an argument that goes on forever in, in our country. But the, 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 what, that was taken away completely from the missile development group at Pena Mundi and turned over for the missile production group uh, at, the, uh, at this uh, facility in middle Germany, which I've, I've visited, and that issue will never, never disappear. Let me make a comment on Hermann Oberth. When he first came, uh, there were a group of us in the technical feasibility study office in a sort of a bullpen arrangement in the building that held the rocket auditorium. And Herman had his desk just sort of next to mine. And every noon, came noon, he ate his lunch, he brought his lunch in a, in his briefcase. His, the, the little the, the checkered? Yeah, in a briefcase. Table, well, yeah. And then he'd, he'd set his alarm clock and he'd put his head down on the desk for half an hour and take a nap. His alarm clock would go off with an awful roar. He'd jump up and go back to work. <laughs> to think. Yeah, to think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Go back to thinking. You were talking about Dr. Reese, that Barbara Reese. Uh, one of my fun jobs was developmental testing in the early days in Marshall. And we would be working way after Speak hours. Speak up to everybody in there. Yeah. We, we would be working way after hours and think everybody had gone home. All of a sudden, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Ron Brown and Edward Reese would come through the guard gate. They were the only ones that didn't have stopped. Come down and talk with us in detail about everything we had worked on. Every program, uh, people thought he got most of his information from the 10th floor conference room meetings and weekly notes, but he was on the spot. He looked at the hardware three or four times a week. True. Was there a question back there? Yeah, I have an anecdote to add into the uh, stories that we're just putting on there. Because, uh, I was working for Holberg back in the early days, and he had a habit of coming by and asking the question, like you said, what are you doing? And he didn't mean, 
what are you doing at this moment? He meant, what, you know, what's, what's going on? So I asked him one day, so how come he is so interested in what, I'm, in what I myself was doing as an individual? He said, if you think I'm going to go to our weekly meeting with the professor, Dr. Bergamon, and tell him I don't know what's going on in the lab, you're crazy. You're out of filter. Marshall in 1964, and uh, we looked at Von Brown as the dreamer, and he inspired all of us to, to do what we none of us could have done by ourselves for certain. But Reese, we looked at as Mr. Inside. Uh, Von Brown was Mr. Outside. He he would talk to Congress, he'd talk to presidents, he would talk to ladies' garden clubs, <laughs> that kind of thing. But Reese was. Uh, more or less the chief operating officer of Marshall Space Flight Center. Von Brown probably was the world's best sailor. He was, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and when you read the, the little booklet, you'll you'll see how he sold the Alabama legislature on funding the mm -hmm. university here. You, you know, we NASA had a Gulf Stream turbo plane, <laughs> and if you were fortunate enough. Uh, Hills, maybe nine people, but um, one Ron would, would be going to Washington, and he would sit back there and talk to us. And just before takeoff, he'd go up and take off, and then and when we get to our destination, uh, he'd go back up and land the plane. And all my friends that were were worried about what he was the best pilot I ever flew with. He was great. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I understand when they first opened the research institute, uh, it was in a facility that was a temporary facility that was kind of operated by Teledyne Brown, or it was Brown Engineering. Uh, but I, I've never really heard much about that. Uh, uh, do you know anything about those that, that first institute facility? It was just uh, rented space or borrowed space. Uh, while they uh, finished the design and built the the research institute building, uh, but they immediately started hiring people. There was such a desperate need for professors to teach different courses and mm. do different pieces of research that they went ahead and hired them and brought them on board before the uh, the building was completed. So they were busy doing research and. Uh, dealing with graduate students, supervising graduate students, and teaching graduate courses. That was the the big need immediately was to bring in some top-notch uh, educators to help staff the place that needed to be staffed. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little story when I came here. I'm a real Yankee, brought up mainly in the state of Maine, partly in New York, partly in, in, in Massachusetts, and I had good friends here. Uh, uh, Harry Rett from Harvard, and he said, Fred, if they can handle the Germans, they can handle the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that um, people can also reference is Ed Buckby's recent efforts in the weekly notes uh, of Von Brown. It's on uh, CD and it's available. Um, that's interesting because I asked uh, Dieter Grau what he did weekends and whatnot, and I guess those weekly notes were due Monday. And he said, I spent all weekend working on those damn weekly notes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another funny thing that I've heard through the years was Walt Wiesman. He said that uh, the ninth floor was an architectural miracle because everybody's office was right next to Von Brown. <laughs> <laughs> University of Alabama Extension, Phil Mason was in charge. Then we, we met at uh, places two nights a week at Old Butler High School. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had a question over here. Well, it wasn't a question. Uh, my husband uh, taught chemistry here for many years, and we came in the fall of 69, and 
his office, of course, was in the Research Institute. And so this is just real interesting to me. Uh, yeah, he taught chemistry here for 26 years. Dr. Merle Emerson. Oh, yeah. Sure, I know him. He passed away in 98, but um, I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> I one more first time I ever met him was in February of 1956, and I was joining the ABMA team at that time, which had just been formed that week. So right. it was just you starting up. I came down. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I got a chance to meet him. I was over in a little building across from 4200. Uh, it was the Complete Structures and Mechanics Laboratory. And also in there were all the advanced program people, uh, Hans Hermann Curler and his guys. So in that one little building was a lot of brain power. So when I met Dr. Von Brown, I looked down, and guess what? He had a rope tied around his waist. He forgot his belt that day. <laughs> <laughs> Hands on. <laughs> and I've got pictures of him digging ditches, too, when we were, when we were building the observatory. He, he, he would get out there and work. You know, uh, if you age had good professors as they had when they first started here, you were very good. You know, I had Dr. Uh, Dr. Teal for advanced calculus and books. I knew something. And, and Dr. Rival and uh, uh, Hell Brown, most of them were active uh, teaching and doing a wonderful job. This, this I think I see the musicians getting <laughs> yeah. okay. All right. All right. Did you, uh, any other questions? So let me just mention that the musicians are going to play some uh, compositions of Werner von Braun. So you, you want to be sure to hear that he, he was a composer when he was young, and they're going to make maybe the first uh, public uh, presentation of those. In 1961, in his address to the joint session of the Alabama legislature, Dr. Von Braun remarked uh, as follows. It is curiosity that sets man apart. It is curiosity that makes him learn. Uh, this has been true throughout history. First curiosity, then learning, then advancement. The guy who is curious, the restless searcher for new knowledge, never knows where his curiosity will lead him. All he knows is that at some time, in some way, the knowledge he digs up will better the lot of his fellow man. And that's what he said that day, and today we observe this vision, his vision, for the advancement of knowledge. And we do this by unveiling this plaque, this permanent plaque here at the M. Lewis Simon Library. Gentlemen, can you take that? We'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're old. <laughs> Good. All right, now if you all like to adjourn, adjourn to the art gallery, have some light refreshments and uh, painting and music.